Welcome to the Boss It Weekly podcast, a no-nonsense, no-hype, frank and close-up analysis of what is currently working and what is not in the world of software. The Boss It podcast is packed with major takeaways for software business owners and managers. So, let's begin. And welcome to another Boss It podcast, sitting in, in wonderful self-isolation here. I've got a guest to introduce to you who has been very, very busy over the last few weeks um, because what he what they do as an organization is organize um, actual uh, events for senior executives within the software sector. And obviously, because with recent changes, he's had to make a lot of changes. So I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Littlewood from Business of Software, uh, BOSS, B-O-S for short. Um, Welcome, Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? Very uh, well. A, excellent. Just a quick point. I'm not quite in self-isolation. Uh, I'm going to get to a point fairly quickly where I think self-isolation would be a dream because I've got two children here at home uh-huh. <laughs> and a uh, wife. So all four of us are uh, vying for internet and the best places in the house to sit. And uh, yeah, all all fun and games. Yeah, there's a lot of people having to adapt at the moment. So uh, yeah, I think it's going to be uh, quite different for for all of us. It's a quite a surreal world. But I wanted to talk about um, business of software. Tell us about business software. How long have you been going? Where did it start? And what is it you actually do? Because I think this is going to be of interest to a lot of listeners of Bossip. Great. Uh, sure. So business of software was set up by. A friend of mine, Neil Davidson, who is one of the co-founders and and was co-CEO of a company called Redgate Software. They produce .NET developer tools. It was a self-funded business and he built the business to about 30 people and wanted to continue to grow it. Uh, wanted to teach himself actually a little bit about what being a CEO is all about and what being an entrepreneur was about. Uh, So he decided to go to some conferences to learn about that particular topic and all he saw in conferences were were lots of code conferences there were lots of conferences for startups there were lots of pitch fests for startups there were lots of events that were very focused on financial aspects of running a business and taking venture capital or taking private equity or getting an exit and very little about that core hard stuff strategy people marketing sales uh, design product that uh, he really wanted to to know all about as he couldn't find anything to go to he did that thing that entrepreneurs do and he said well if i was going to go to an event who would be the 12 most brilliant people that i could learn from yes and he came up with a list of names and then he got in touch with them and said hey i'm running this conference do you want to speak uh, and at the first event he had jeffrey moore uh, Joel Spolsky, Don Norman, Kathy Sierra, all sorts of uh, incredible, smart, sensible people that were doing uh, interesting things. And that's where Business of Software started off. Brilliant. How long ago was the first event? Uh, 2000 and, 2006 was the first sort of mini, mini thing. Yes. Um, uh, we're well into our 20s now because we've been, we run two main conferences, one in the US and one in Europe. Right. And they bring people together from all, all around the world. Um, really kind of typically founder, senior level uh, yes. people in companies of between 20 and 1,000 people. Uh, we uh, have a few people that come uh, from earlier stage companies. They typically tend to be entrepreneurs that are going back and doing another company, and they may be looking for inspiration or looking to see what's changed since they uh, since they were at that kind of stage before. But uh, uh, yeah, very very focused, uh, very different uh, conferences and events um, than uh, most of the things that uh, that are out there. They are long form, so single track. Um, we only have one one stage and all of the talks are long form so they're anything up to uh, up to an hour yes and that slightly when i was first talking to neil about this filled me with horror because an hour is a very very long time to be trapped in a room and sat still but if you get the right people 
uh, speaking, uh, that works out very well. And one of my secret superpowers uh, is actually ADHD, which uh, I hadn't realised I had until uh, a few years ago. If you name one of the top 100 films, I have literally a 9% chance of having seen it. <laughs> I get bored by the time, I mean, bored stupid by the time the opening credits come up so i'm not i'm really not one to to sit still so if a speaker's going to persuade me that they're going to keep me engaged and entertained everybody else is golden all oh, right okay that's interesting yeah so and, and whereabouts do you hold the conferences because uh, is it in the same place in the states i think in europe you've moved around is it the same in the states well yes yeah. so we we've run it in in the states we we ran it in uh, in san jose in san francisco on the west coast and we've run it in boston but for the last uh, 10 12 years uh, certainly since i've been involved and I'd, i've known neil for a long time i was running an, an event business in the tech industry uh, when i was talking to neil about business software he asked me to to take it over and i've been basically running for uh, it for him since he he set it up but certainly for the last 12 years we have been running it in boston right and that works very well for us for multiple reasons we have a lot of attendees that come from europe uh, we have yes. people coming from all over the states but then yeah. further afield south america australia um south africa and five hour time difference in running an event there is is just much less draining than when we're running the event we run into san francisco set something up where you know, we have to get there a week earlier and it's exhausting and there's just such a, a big difference in the in the jet lag and the energy required to to do that but i also think boston and the east coast is a little bit more you know it's a good bridge between the the mania of the west coast yes and uh, the more pragmatic and measured view that i think uh, european software companies tend to take obviously yes that's massively um stereotyping stereotyping things but it's a you know there's a huge amount going on and uh it works really well i mean uh, I've, I've not actually been to one of your events yet but it, it, the more i find i find out about it the more enticing um it looks we've actually we i mean we've got exactly the same sort of market that we speak to and mm. that's one of the reasons why i thought it would be really nice to have you on the boss it podcast um and because we're, we're talking to the same people. yeah no it's great and, and i think it it looks it looks an event full of energy. I mean, getting all of those people together in the same room, all focused, rather than the sort of the the exhibition type, which used to be popular years and years ago. Where you get these stands, and there'll be sort of little events going on. I'm not a great fan of those. I haven't been to one for many years, uh, not in this industry <laughs> anyway. Um, I think the idea of having everyone focused on that one, you know, some really good speakers, the one topic. How many people do you typically get along to these events? Uh, well, well, we cap it. We, I mean, very deliberately cap it. Because, sure. uh, so in the US, it's capped at 400 in right. Europe. So it's, it's, it's really small. I mean, over two and a half days, you can pretty much know that not only are you going to be able to see the people that uh, you, or you you listen to the talks that you want to, which is generally uh, all of them, but you're actually going to have lots of opportunity to then sit down and talk to other people. So it's a fully fully kind of catered affair. People, we have a uh, dinner and reception the night before it starts. We have breakfast. Everyone has sit-down breakfast at, at, at tables for the three days of the event. We do dinners. Ah, uh, okay. It's very structured and we put a lot of thought into it, but yes. it doesn't feel regimented, if that makes yes. sense. So we, we split people up. Uh, we really think about the design and the UX of the, the event. We know that lots of people are introverted. We know that lots of people don't really like going in and talking to big groups of people where one or two people will dominate the conversation. Yes. yes. Uh, we split <clears throat> the tables up. We put little... Uh, we put notices on each of the tables so that you've got something that you might want to talk about, whether that's SAS metrics or uh, preparing for an exit or 
design thinking or whatever it is so we we put signs on tables so people can go and find a table where they might have some common interest with other people uh, and also do things like quiet tables uh, so if you just want to sit and have lunch by yourself and not be bothered by people um there is a place for that uh, those are always the noisiest tables by the way, <laughs> weirdly uh, <laughs> It's actually, when you when you put a bunch of of introverts together on a table, good things happen. But yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a, yeah. I mean, some great ideas there. I really like that. I think you're right. Is that probably particularly in the software sector that there are a lot of introverts that that wouldn't like the idea of sort of being put on the spot, speaking in front of lots of people. But I think if you create the right environment for them. Uh, they they will want to speak, and a lot of people can, can benefit from that. It's it's about creating the environment in which it works for them, and they feel comfortable. I guess. Yeah, and I think those people have so much to say and yes. so much to offer, and quite often, many many years of thinking about things and not being given the opportunity to get those things out. That when you when you actually put them in a space and enable that, it uh, it 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 does does good things. Um, yes. So yeah, and it's it's a very. I mean, I think the difference you were talking about these the exhibitions and things. Nobody likes those, but everybody does them, and yes. it's probably the. It's certainly the easiest way to make money in the event business in the software um, industry is to have an event where you have exhibitors and sponsors and sponsors exhibit and then they bring the little laser guns along to um, scan people's badges and then each of the sponsors has little speaking slots that take ever more increasing amounts of the stage time and then you put yes. second stage, third stage, fourth stage and all of a sudden you've got an event that's 500 speakers and yes. blah, 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 blah. And actually, we very, very consciously positioned ourselves as something completely the opposite of that. Yes. We want, we want the people that get it and want to spend time with other smart people thinking and talking about the things that matter to them to come to, and that's great. And it, there are plenty of other ways of doing events, and there are plenty of other other places that people can go if you know they're only going to come if they're going to speak. Or yes, those are usually very good signs that they're probably not the right speakers for us in a way. But uh, yeah, we do we do our own thing. We do it. I, I'd like to think very well. We have to because we actually, are, and we're probably unique in the industry. We have a money back guarantee for attendees if they attend and don't feel they get value. We refund their ticket price. Um, well, that's, and that keeps that's confidence. Quite focused. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I I also like the point that you made about it's probably the opportunity for people to articulate ideas and thoughts that they've had. I'm a great believer in that. I've mm. seen that. I, I've actually experienced it myself. I mean, Bossit podcast for me is partly that. It's mm. it's getting on, speaking to different people within the industry, really knowledgeable people that have got points to make. But I find, you know, as you know now, this is completely unstructured. We, we just are having a conversation. And I find that there are things that I will say that I've probably been in the back of my mind, but it does help me facilitate my own thinking. So I can really get that and I can see how that can work. Oh, absolutely. And I think you've got a, a really interesting range of different topics and uh, voices on the on the podcast actually i think you've you've uh you've done a really good job in keeping it eclectic um and it and i think the kind of people that probably both of us are interested in talking to are they might be obsessed about sales yes for a certain amount of time but they don't want to subscribe to some sales newsletter or podcast or whatever that's going through all the basics of sales yes. time and time and time again and just just re relentlessly ad nauseum. They actually, it's it's much more that kind of CEO or almost the yes. product manager type role of 
some people really like to be an expert in the thing they're expert in and they get into it and that's all they care about. And there are other people who are slightly more generalist uh, and want to understand how all of the different bits of a business work, how they come together, yes, uh, how they how they interact. And for that, you need not just an appreciation of those things, but you also need to know the really important elements and aspects of all the different parts of a uh, an organization and so yeah i think we were both from that perspective serving a a, a similar need there absolutely and i think that, that actually is a great intro for what we thought might be a, a sort of a focus for this podcast and as i say we, we sort of let it go wherever wherever the conversation goes but i thought it would be interesting to get you know some of your thoughts because you will have listened now to a lot of speakers you have spoken to a lot of people within the industry as i have Mm. And, and I feel privileged to be able to do that. I think every client that I have, every prospective client that I speak to, yes, they, they hopefully they'll get some value in speaking to me. But I also get immense value because I hear about their experiences. I, mm. I learn about the problems that they've had. And, and you start to, I mean, our brains are, are probably one of the most powerful aspects that the human brain has is pattern matching. And that happens subconsciously. And by having a lot, I don't know how many people I've spoken to in the software sector in my career, but it's thousands. And I think that pattern matching helps to facilitate my thinking to say, actually, there there are patterns happening here. You know, I can see that there are things, there's sort of do's and don'ts. Um, it's It's quite complex. And I think I get you what you're saying is you do get those sort of, the latest internet thinking which seems to go around the world and you think, oh, that's probably the 10th time I've seen that today. The sort of um, very much sort of sales systems or marketing systems, I've got the latest system. And Well, yeah, they're all they lies. Be... But yes, no, that, that's yeah. true. Yeah, if it, <laughs> it's just not that simple. But there are things and I think it, it, it requires deeper thinking and hopefully one of the things that this podcast does and I think definitely what your conferences do is enabling the industry to think more deeply and mm. quite often you you know you you come up with your own answer but what are the things that that you that really sort of stick in your mind are the sort of the mistakes that perhaps you've seen software vendors make and and then let's talk about you know, some of the right things to do. Let's talk generally about that. What are, If I start to say to you, you know, what are the key things that you've learned over the years? And then perhaps I'll throw in a few of my own. What comes to mind? Well, I like you said that we were going to be playing table tennis and you were going to yes. send me the ball and I was going to yes. send it back. And that's I right. said, oh, you were going to send me the ball and I'll pick it up off the floor. But <laughs> if that's the way you want to go, sir, uh, I think I'll give you one and then you can give me one back. Let's, let's do so it. I think yeah. My uh, my first one, um, and it it relates to. So here's the here's the thing I think that that everybody would like to think is true, but anyone that's experienced realizes it isn't. Is that is there are no easy answers. There are no one fuss size fits all answers. There are plenty of people out there selling snake oil, the yes. seven sexy secrets to SaaS success. Number six will yes. uh, alliterate your uh, head off. Yes. There are these people that kind of go off and do their little um, thought leading international keynote speaking. Yes power play talks at various events and they're verging on criminally fraudulent in terms of what they're what they're doing and what they're selling yes they're selling themselves and they're selling attention and really i think the biggest most important thing that i've come to learn is that every business exists in its own unique context and that context is very complex yes now if I'm talking to an entrepreneur, that's very different to talking to a, an organization. If you can talk to an organization, every entrepreneur has different goals and not everybody is there is, is, is doing something to make X million pounds or employ Y number of people or yes, people 
motivated by different things. Yes, and, absolutely. And they fall into the trap sometimes of starting to do these things and then just getting sucked into the orthodox belief that is out there, which at the moment and for the last 10, 15 years has really been uh, driven by what's the revenue of your company and how much money have you raised at what valuation? Yes, that's just insane because it it sort of discounts the value of all sorts of other yes. other things. As an entrepreneur having you have choices, and we're talking now. I don't know when this will um, end up getting uh, edited and being sent out, but uh, we're talking at a very uncertain time. We're all working from home. The first reaction of a lot of companies is to fire a bunch of people. Yes. The first reaction of other people I know who have made different choices in the way that they've been running their businesses is how can we continue to do what we're doing and maintain the headcount that we have because we've built up a group of people who are supremely talented. We don't have external investors, for example, so we're not answerable to third parties that are going to come in and have a, a, a disproportionate effect on our strategy and the way that we run. You know, a lot of people kind of get sucked into the how much money have you raised, what's the valuation, I'm yes. a unicorn or not a unicorn, go big or go home. And, you know, those are just lies perpetuated by the money. This doesn't this isn't the sort of big anti capitalist rant. It's it I mean it's the it's the way it is. I mean uh, investors behave in a completely rational way and they want people to believe and to to think that the only way to grow a massive business is to take investment because they're selling money. It's easier to write headlines about a company that's taken sixty million or six hundred million dollars for a dog walking app that either, you know, from the headline writers proves that someone is doing amazingly and this is actually the future of uh, humanity, or actually, you know, we've all completely lost sight of our senses and you know, investing is investing is crazy. It doesn't it's much easier to write those headlines than write headlines about some incredible company that's employing 50 people, has 10 million uh, users across the world that are saving three hours a week of time doing some quite boring thing related to HR or payroll or something. Those are not sexy stories, so they don't no. get don't get talked about but oh my goodness we are living in a in an age when the SaaS and the opportunities and the change in the whole software landscape are are massive and and there are people that can take you know, create substantial businesses and, and build fabulous lives and lifestyles for themselves and their employees in a in a way that you know, is just is just not part of that the motorway of stories that that, that comes out of the press yeah well it, it really interesting because you mentioned a number of things that i would sort of like to go back to i think you were starting out and it is one of the things that i've seen and, and in fact i think i mentioned this to somebody i was speaking to just a couple of days ago is the the thing about the advisors the consultants the experts out there and i've met with um, many companies senior executives that have abused people when you look on linkedin sometimes i think there's more advisors advising than actually doing the work and that oh, that yeah. concerns me so um, many out then, there then go on linkedin and look up tedx speaker because that's my favorite <laughs> Uh, job title uh, which is a separate category even from advisors um, i've never tried that I've, i can imagine <laughs> just just bear in mind that tedx are independently run conferences and events so um being a tedx speaker does not imply any yeah <laughs> No, there's no, there's no sort there's, of standard. There's a difference. There's a difference between TED and TEDx. Put it that way. Yes. Um, no matter what you think about either. <laughs> yeah. So I think that that is that is a concern. And, and I mean, I, I've been in this industry a long time, and I can track the career of certain people that have worked within larger organisations, and I can understand the attractiveness of being seen as a an independent consultant within the industry. Mm. But I can also look at them and say, oh, I know your background, though. That makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Yes. And, and there is a lot of snake oil out there where and I've, I've seen it close at hand in the area of marketing 
and so mm. in all areas but marketing where they've got this sort of this formula and this formula works you know and it's 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 amazing and it's just sort yeah. of points one to ten and you follow them and you'll get amazing results yeah i don't find that works no it just it just doesn't and i suppose no. Um, to answer your question rather than just go on a big rant, you know, the mistake people are making there is that you know, they're expecting that there are answers and, and, and paths that they can follow. I think the, the, the solution to that is to think deeply, as you've, you've alluded to before, but think deeply about the right questions. And that's yes. something that we try to help people do at the at the conferences and the events that we run yes. um, quite often if you could if you can understand your context and or what your view of the range of success might be for you then the answers to the questions are relatively straightforward the tricky thing is to ask the right questions in absolutely the first place. yeah ask a good question you'll get a good answer i'm a great believer in that yeah. and i think the other point that you touched upon, which which I really resonated with, was about motivation. The motivation behind some people starting a business is not that they want to create a unicorn software business. It may be that they can see a problem that needs solving and they can see that that will do a lot of good. And I've had other organizations that I've spoken to that have been going 20 years and they're proudly saying to me, 90% of my employees have been with me all 20 years we all get on really well and it's been a good stable job for them that's really important to them yeah and i think that there there has been and i think it is changing i think that there and this was something that started i believe in the 70s where everything was about the investment in a business and and shareholders return and there are many other things that i think that are very important in the software industry i always say it's a really fast moving industry and it's very important for the whole world because the whole world is is turning digital and it's moving mm. very very quickly and SaaS is at the heart of that and it can change lives and it's not all about you know i mean m a <laughs> that's one of the things that we yeah. do but it's not all about that big check at the end there are times when i think it's right that we have perhaps founders that they go on a journey with the business and they get to a certain stage and they say, actually, I need to go on and do something different or I need to allow my business to grow without me. Yeah. It's not all about, it's amazing how often that when you sit down and this is in exactly the same as yourselves, we hope to help facilitate the thinking of our clients is to say what's really important yeah. to you. They will say, well, obviously money is, but it's probably fourth. I want to make sure mm. that there's a good home for my employees. I want to make sure that the solution that we've created can go on and do further good than I can probably do myself. I've lost my energy or I want to go and do something else. And I think understanding that motivation is really important. Yeah, I agree. So go back to Neil, who I mentioned before, who, yes. who uh, I've known for a long time, who set uh, business software up and was co-CEO of Regate Software. And that's, it's been self-funded or self-funded, bootstrapped, organically grown, whatever you wanted to call it. Yes. Uh, he actually left Redgate because he got to a point where he wasn't enjoying it in the way that he was. And he wasn't enjoying running a software company with 300 people. That, uh, and his uh, his partner, Simon uh, Galbraith, uh, was, was different and, and absolutely was. Neil, Neil left and he went and he did an MPhil in 15th century Dutch art. And he enjoyed that so much, he did one in 15th century Italian art. And then he did a fine art degree at the Courtauld. And now he is running a, an artist studio in the Cotswolds and has never been happier. And when he made that move originally, people were like, oh, well, has it been kicked out? Has it been? You know, there were so many kind of weird questions about what he was up to or what was going on. And there was this sort of assumption that something had gone gone wrong whereas actually what he'd really decided was that he'd worked out what he wanted to do with his life and then oh. he went to did it and yeah. uh, it's pretty unusual <laughs> I, it, absolutely I, when when first start i mean i started this business it was two of us that started it and um we started it in 1999 
And one of the first observations that we made, especially in those early days, because it was just the two of us, is mm. we found it quite odd that when we introduced the business, the first thing that people would say is, how many employees have you got? Yeah. They're trying to make an assessment as to how big your company is. And when you think about it, it is quite, it's quite a sort of a fixed and an odd mindset, really. It's not, not so much, what do you do? Yeah. What, what good could you do? How big are you? How much money are you making? How much profit yeah. are you making? <laughs> Especially when you it's, first started, you know. <laughs> how big are you? How many people? I mean, and it's, it, it always, or it almost always comes down to how many people or how much revenue? Yes. People tend not to even say how much profit. No. They no. don't think about how many customers. They don't. No. You know what? What? What's your impact? What are your? I mean, I know some some fantastic businesses that, I mean, just are wonderful because they do things in a different way, and they're you know they're they're very profitable operations. It's one one which I, I don't know if you use Max, but if you do, you may yes. have a productivity app called Doist, and Doist has another there's another product in the company's range uh, which is called Twist, which right. is absolutely fantastic. It's like Slack, but it works. <laughs> I like that description. <laughs> That's a great positioning. Like Slack, uh, but it works. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, sort of Slack was just pitched as this incredible email killer, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it's, it, it Brilliant. just creates, you know, that kind of synchronous communication thing that, that is not conducive to deep work, to deep thinking, to yes. to anything. And and. Twist, which is this uh, this product that I'm thinking of, is actually designed by a company that is now 140 people. Right. Yes. And fully remote, fully distributed. Right. I think they have employees in about 60 or 70 different countries around the world. Yes. And the founder, fabulous guy, Amir Salafahendik, was a refugee from Serbia who was brought up in Denmark, married a Chilean, went to Chile to get married, set this business up, couldn't find a developer, and so found one in Denmark that he was mates with at college. Um, and so they set the company up as a remote business by default from yes. day one. And is now, as I said, 120, 140 people around the world, self-funded, very profitable, has just been mentioned as one of those companies that will do fantastically well out of uh, the uh, disaster world that we're currently living through because it's facilitating remote uh, communication and uh, all sorts of things. And, you know, brilliant, brilliant, very profitable, can do what it, what it wants. One of the really interesting things that they do is that some people employ – people remotely because you have an opportunity to do some uh, salary arbitrage so i mean the classic you know in the 90s was outsourced stuff to um india, india. and then it was an outsource to outsource to to um ukraine and various yes. places but you know the salaries of people grew up there Yes. Rose in those places. There is this theory that if you remote work around the world, you can find places where there are talented people and not paying not paying very much. You can pay them more than they would be getting where they're actually living. Sure, but it would be a lot less than what you would pay them if you were employing them in your headquarters. Amir's view is actually you pay the same wherever someone is and he has people in he has uh, someone in Nepal and he's paying them as he would someone who is based in Barcelona which is their for reasons their notional headquarters so they they earn the same as someone doing the same job would earn in Barcelona and they are literally uh, keeping people in the whole i mean it's it's they have a a a significant effect on the village that they yes. live and yeah that's a great that's a great thing it is and it's you know those those sorts of you know enlightened enlightened approaches different approaches to to the capitalist challenge which i think are, are, are fascinating and we had our conference uh, earlier this week and it, it was in cambridge uh, i was in cambridge but uh, it was it was uh, all completely online because uh, if people are reading this in 2021 and we're all still alive the country the whole world was pretty much in lockdown i think I was just hearing about 50% of the world's population is in lockdown now. Yes. Well, it was quite impressive what I heard because you, 
I mean, it was relatively short notice, and you changed mm. from being, you know, to a vert, you changing your conference to a virtual one. But that's about flexibility and being able to adapt to the circumstances. And, mm. and, and you know, and well done for doing that. And and I think you got some benefits from it. Yes, we did actually. We did, and I'm uh, happy happy to talk about those in a little a little bit if you're uh, you're interested. One of the speakers we had is a lady called Rita Gunter McGrath, Professor Rita Gunter McGrath, who's a business school professor at Columbia Business School in the States and one of the top five strategy people in the world. And she was sharing her framework of thinking about the future and thinking about the ways that uh, the world can world will will go and could go and thinking about some of the consequences of the world moving in a number of different directions and i think you know her strong sense is that you know the kind of stakeholder capitalism model um that is driven by rampant consumerism is just not something that's that's very sustainable and we've all kind of known that for a long time yes but haven't really wanted to think about it yes. um, and we're now forced into a situation where we all have to think about it very very hard and very um as a matter of urgency because i mean there are things that are gonna that are gonna fail and the fact that the airlines are doing share buy- buybacks for for years, you know, over the last five years, I think the airlines have done about fifty billion dollars in America of share buybacks, and are now looking for fifty billion dollars bailout from the government. You know, is that is that right? And are they the people that will get the the handouts yes. first? Should they? Yeah, much bigger, bigger, bigger questions there. Though. Yeah, certainly. Even I, there was one bit of news that caught my eye was about the environmental changes because people are trapped traveling less there's less planes mm. in the sky and dolphins had been sighted in venice the water was running clearer uh, uh, quite amazing i don't know how true that was but it's just something i picked up a couple of times that idea that just this relatively short change in working the way that we're working could have that much of an effect uh, mm. i don't know how long this is going to go on for but who knows what the, i think there could be some positives that come of this and you always hopefully, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of problems that will come from this virus without a doubt. And there's going to be people that lose yeah. their lives and you can't, you can't underplay that. You know, it's serious. We wouldn't all be locked in our homes if it wasn't serious, but hopefully that's, that's out of side of our control. There's not much we can mm. do about that apart from behave sensibly and, and you know, and, and the social distancing part is important. But there may also be some positives that we can take from it. And part of it is our ability to work remotely more effectively. The technology has been there, but I don't think that our mindset has been there. And also to really take seriously you know, some of the, the environmental issues that are created when we are continually doing this traveling to meet. I mean, we're, you know, we're in different parts of, of the UK at the moment having a conversation. I don't think mm. the conversation has been watered down the fact that we, we're not sitting, you know, within touching distance of each other. No, and I, I've, because we work with people all around the world and... I was quite lazy in a way. I hate getting on planes because they, you know, they defy the laws of physics for a start. So, um, uh, but you know, most of the time, people are so used, and I think in the in the tech industry, very used to uh, doing a lot of things by email, by various written communication methods. Face to face is really really important. It's really nice, but it's it's it's. It's not essential. I think what face-to-face can do is to help you build relationships and help build trust with people. Uh, but that trust goes a goes a long way. And you know, we've certainly been thinking for years about different ways of keeping our community going between events. And we run pretty regular uh, online meetups where... You know, we'll have a speaker on who's done a talk, for example, and they'll come back and we'll have a and a session and we'll be joined by, um, you know, our numbers are never, never big because we don't want, we don't want 
thousands of people watching something and asking questions and taking yes. part. And I don't mean that in a um, mean way. It's just if you have thousands of people watching something, that's a different thing to yes. a, a few hundred people yes. having a conversation about yes. something. And the two things are very, uh, very different. There's a different value that you can deliver with the smaller yeah. numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've we've often thought, well, maybe we should do these online things, and you know, as luck would have it, uh, we got the opportunity to put all of those uh, plans that we were never really going to um, put into action um, out and out and uh, make them happen in in pretty pretty short amount of time. I mean, I guess we'd been thinking about, as I said, for a long time, but it was really six six weeks of planning to turn it from a physical event into a uh, a fully on online virtual experience and some things were far better now i'm not going to lie there were things that weren't better yes uh and we thought a lot about content and program and um said when we were uh, talking earlier that we we think very very consciously about how we design an experience for people um and you know, i don't know whether we we got it all completely right i think we did uh we 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 got a we were lucky and got a lot of things um far far better than we could have ever hoped that they they would be we uh, changed the content so that the talks were shorter and the questioning uh, the question sessions were longer we had lots of breakout spaces and meeting spaces and things going on like the birds of the feather tables but happening uh virtually uh and actually for many people those were even better than doing that in real in real life um and there was something very leveling about everybody essentially sitting in front of a laptop with a camera probably some kind of thing in the background going on um uh, be it babies or children or cats or dogs or a python or a chameleon (laughs) actually how do we even know the chameleon was there thinking about it (laughs) So, but, so you just have a very different. It was much easier for some people to interact in the and and talk to other people and network in those types of environments uh, than it would be in a in a big room where, you know, I don't know about you. A lot of people call me um, highly extrovert, but actually, it takes me a huge amount of energy to walk into a room where I don't know anybody. It it yeah. it requires a lot of. Uh, effort and I'm very sensitive to the fact that you know people find that very difficult whereas you're all sort of shoved into a little room and there's six of you on screen you talk to each other you find out who's interesting what they're doing what they're up to uh, and yeah works much works much better actually well I I think you need to be uh, you and your colleagues need to be commended for pulling that off in such short time and, and I think well, what you my colleagues, out... my colleagues do. I, I, I'm <laughs> conference disorganizer, uh, and they are the organizers and pull it together. And um, they generally try and keep me in a sack under the table, and uh, don't let me don't let me come out. But uh, they were they were very indulgent this time. But I think also <laughs> what you've outlined is a, is a really interesting uh, conference that I think will be of interest to to a lot of the people that I speak to and and, and a lot of the people that I think listen to the Bossit podcast. Um, mm. If people want to find out more information uh, about your conferences, I've just did a search business of software and I got up your. You, have you got a European website and then there's one for the USA and they're sort of yes. Like, so right. things things will change, but we have businessofsoftware.org. Okay. And business of software dot eu. Okay. Um, but uh, the the all of the videos, I think the so there's there's lots of stuff about the conference. But actually, the the thing that is most useful and most interesting for most people are the previous talks. And because we they're all long form, uh, they go back to two thousand and seven. We've got a lot of them. We've got over 
over about 300 hours now of, of talks and follow-up talks and this, that and the other from Jeffrey Moore, Clayton Christensen, you know, a lot of lot of kind of companies that are big and public now, Toby Lutka from Shopify, Scott Farquhar from Atlassian, Joel Spolsky from Stack Exchange. You know, some 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 really interesting and thoughtful people. Uh, so, yeah, there's always a tab with videos or um, speakers or blog or, uh, you know, all of those, all of those uh, things signpost you to, uh, to all of the talks. And we also have a magic thing that we run for our, um, we, we have a newsletter that we send out occasionally. And one of the perks of that is we have an, an ML based system to help people navigate their way through the talks. So if you sign up to the newsletter, you're asked if there's a particular problem that you're struggling with, and we will hand-select, using our ML-based system, uh, some talks that will help you. Now, ML does not mean machine learning. You understand that's Mark Littlewood. <laughs> um, right. I had written... I'd written down ML. You... You'd led me up the garden path there, hadn't you? I was I had was thinking machine learning. <laughs> I always say ML inside and people are like, Oh wow, that's really sophisticated and I'm like, I'm really not that sophisticated. But we do care. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. It sounds a very personalized service. Well, it's been brilliant talking to you, Mark, and, and actually Thank we've you. been talking for nearly fifty minutes. And I didn't oh, wow. want to stop you because I thought it was fascinating. And I really wanted to make sure that the people who listen to Bossit have a really good understanding and feel for business of software, but also got a feel for you because I think that is also quite important and will give people a feeling about what, you know, what these conferences are like. Oh, and thank you. definitely. And, and likewise, really great to, great to, and to what, talk. Continue. And we will send this to you. And if you want to put this on your website, that that's great to do as well. And I, because I think that there could be really good cross pollination here, um, and I'd be happy to do that. So, thank you very much for coming on this. Um, really enjoyed the talk, and uh, it, let's keep in touch because I think that yeah, um, you know there's a lot of alignment there. <laughs>